Good morning, and welcome to this morning's worship service. I'm Pastor Beth Apple. This is the worship service for Chansford and New Harmony Presbyterian Churches in Southern York County, Pennsylvania. And I welcome you. If you're a church member, welcome. If you're a friend, welcome. If you're a stranger and you just stumbled upon this video, you too are welcome, no matter who you are or where you are. Welcome to this service on the sixth Sunday of Easter. Before we begin our service, I have a few concerns to share with you that you can keep in your heart this week. Our friend Janet Shove, who served for many years as Chansford's clerk of session, has been released from her suffering after a long illness. Janet went to be with the Lord this past Thursday morning Please keep her son Darren, her sister Betty, and all their family members in your prayers. We also want to hold Gordon Sinclair from the New Harmony Church in prayer as he recovers from surgery this week at York Hospital. And for those who may not have heard the news, we are celebrating with Katie and Simon McTavish the birth of their new baby boy, Finn Robert, who was born on April 24th. Congratulations. I also want to announce that the Chansford session has approved moving forward with Sunday morning parking lot worship, which may start as early as next week. Be on the lookout for an email this week with further details and instructions. And now I'd like to call us to worship with these words from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help them when the morning dawns. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Friends, we know that the time of our life is in God's hands, and we want to make the most of our days. And so when we gather, we reflect on our lives, particularly the events of the, the, events of the past week, and we offer them to God so that we can be free to leave behind what has hurt us and move forward in confidence. So let us now spend a few moments in silence bringing before God whatever joys we are savoring and whatever concerns are weighing us down as we reflect on the week gone by. Let us pray. God of the universe, giver of darkness and light, yours are the heights and depth the fullness and emptiness, the sorrow and joy of existence. We limit you by presuming that you are only present where there is light. We confess that in times of change and confusion, we often do not realize your care. We plunge through obstacles, unwilling to admit that our problem might be a gift in disguise. Lord God, help us to consider your purpose in that which bewilders us. Forgive us and heal us of the mistrust which has forgotten that we are held in your hands through all of life's seasons. Amen. Now let us hear these words of assurance. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives us all our sins strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. I invite Piper to join me now as we share our children's message. Have a seat. Let's move this over a little. Good morning, Piper. Good morning. Okay, so this morning, we're talking about time. So I have one of these. Do you know what this is? Um, a time? 
<laughs> an hourglass. It's hour. usually called an hourglass. It could be called a timer. If it was little, it could be an yeah. egg timer. And we have a clock. And, and uh, what else do we have? We have a wristwatch. Yeah. Sometimes I tell time by looking at my cell phone or I look at the microwave or the, the digital clock on the oven. But we have ways of knowing what time it is. Now, normally, when we're not sheltering in place with coronavirus um, pandemic, we think more about time, don't we? We have more of a schedule. I know when you're in school, every hour you've got something scheduled that you yep. have to have to do or have to be at, and we have meetings, and we. But and, now we don't. But now we don't. Time is very different now, and I have a question for you. Does time seem to go faster now or slower now? How are you experiencing this? Faster. You think it goes faster? The yeah. days go by a little faster when you're not in school? Yeah. At first I thought it went really, really slowly. I couldn't believe how each day just really seemed long, but now they're going by a lot more quickly, maybe because we're more used to the routine that we're in but it's definitely not as scheduled. So we're thinking of time, and we're thinking of how we organize our time, and I'm thinking also today about how time seems to go by and things change. Things don't always stay the same, right? Mm -hmm. We get a year older, we move to a different grade, like you moving to um, sixth grade next year. Um, things change. But the one thing I want us to remember is that God doesn't change. God is always the same, right? Yeah. And we always know that God is with us and God loves us. And that's one thing in the universe that we can always depend on. There are some things that change and some things that stay the same. And it's the love of God that always stays the same no matter what we're going through. Okay? Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for each one of our days. We pray that we may savor each one and enjoy it and learn what you would have us learn, even in this time when everything is so different and our schedule is so unusual. We pray that you will help us to make the most of our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's turn to our Old Testament reading. I have two scripture lessons today, an Old Testament and a New Testament reading. The first one is from Ecclesiastes chapter three, verses one through eight. Okay. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And then from Matthew chapter six, verses 28 to 33, part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to them, Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, 
Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever said to yourself, I can't wait till things get back to normal? Well, no doubt you have said that many times over these past several weeks. Yet even in less cataclysmic times, this is a common refrain, one we use whenever we enter a new season of life which disrupts our habitual way of doing things. Despite this innate desire for stability, we find that life continues to bring us surprises, both good and bad, and these changes seem anything but normal. Our Old Testament lesson from the preacher known as Ecclesiastes reminds us that life is never static. It is a continual ebb and flow of changing seasons from birth until death, a series of turning points toward growth and change. From childhood through old age, we're constantly at the beginning, in the middle of, or finishing some sort of transition, some which are expected, those developmental changes such as adolescence, the birth of a child, or the midlife crisis, and some which are unexpected and involuntary. Many of us will experience the death of a loved one, estrangement in a personal relationship, the loss of energy and health due to illness or age. Although often painful, the process of change has been with us since the beginning of time. It is said that when Adam and Eve were leaving the Garden of Eden, Adam said to Eve, my dear, apparently now we are entering a period of transition and so it is for all of us. Living as I do in the county I grew up in, I'm always aware of the timeless constants of life and also the effects of change. As anyone who lives in an area where a lot of people spend their entire lives in that same area, I find that people often give directions using landmarks that used to be there. We know that there's been a change, but we still know what used to be there, and so we give directions, like that intersection on Route 30 where the Dairy Queen used to be. And everyone in Lancaster who's lived here for decades knows exactly where you're talking about. I don't know if that's where it, what it's like where you live, but it was the same way when I lived in Rhode Island. So things do change, but one thing that gives Lancaster, the feeling that it never changes, is something that seems to stay the same, and that is the Amish culture. This is a strict religious sect which practices the austere lifestyle and piety of their four parents of three centuries ago. Our Amish neighbors seem to live in their own world exempt from the changes of culture and technology which characterize our 21st century lives. To an outside observer, the Amish stand as witnesses to the human capacity to resist change. And yet, if you are in a position to observe their culture from the inside, you would find that these communities struggle with change to a far greater degree than do those of us who soak into our culture every new modern convenience and gadget without so much as a backward glance. I became particularly aware of the contradictions and inconsistencies inherent in Amish life when I worked for a summer as an assistant to an Amish woman who ran a bed and breakfast for tourists here in Lancaster. This was back in 1988 when I just graduated from seminary and I was in the job search for my first ministry position. 
and I worked for a summer um, with her. She was a woman named Mary, and although she had the typical Amish eighth grade education, she was a very hardworking and successful businesswoman, and I enjoyed spending time with her. And I liked having the opportunity to ask her all of the many questions I had ever wanted to ask an Amish person because I didn't know any other Amish people in my social circle. And except for the times when she would lecture me on why it was sinful for a woman to speak in church, we got along very well. Now the paradoxes of Mary's lifestyle soon became very clear to me. Here was a member of a culture which survives by a policy of separation from the outside world, and yet she was making her livelihood off of the tourist industry, an industry which has been criticized for thriving off of exploiting the Amish. And to accommodate her guests in the manner to which they would be accustomed, Mary furnished each of her guest rooms of her guest house with modern electric lights and appliances, although she herself lived under the same roof without electricity in her own side of the house, only using a kerosene lamp for light. She also um, allowed me to vacuum the floor using her electric vacuum cleaner while she would only use a broom and a dustpan. I could mow the lawn with her power mower, but she couldn't. She had to use a push mower so as not to be reported to her church elders for breaking an ordinance, especially something done out in public like that. She you know, was not able to do it. Um, I could drive her around in my car to run errands, but she was not allowed to drive or hold a driver's license. The payphone in the hall was used for business calls only, and it was very clearly separated from her personal living space, so she couldn't have a, ho a phone in her home. And although the dress code specified that she could only wear black, low-heeled shoes, the ones that she wore um, back then were actually high-top sneakers that were very trendy at the time. Well, although all of these contradictions seemed a little bit ridiculous to me, I've learned that the Amish community has a carefully constructed method to their madness. Every new cultural contrivance which comes along, every 21st century invention which would make their lives infinitely easier, is carefully and thoughtfully evaluated by the leaders of the community to determine if it will have a harmful effect upon the religious, cultural, and social fabric of their society. The accommodations to modernity which get accepted are usually behind the scenes, and they do accept a lot of modern um, appliances. I know many of them use cell phones for their business, but they're invisible to the outside observer, and they're tolerated only as a means to ensure that the community can remain economically viable without compromising the distinct identity and closeness of the community. The identity of the Amish community, therefore, is maintained by setting and carefully adjusting boundaries. And just like in any family system, there are those who push the edges of the boundaries and those whose job it is to reinforce and maintain the boundaries. Well, this little sociology lesson about the Amish simply illustrates the fact that all cultures and communities throughout history have wrestled with change, both individually and corporately. The Latin roots of the word liberal and conservative describe the essence of this struggle. The word liber means to be free, unbound by the past, and the words con and servo mean to save or to keep what's best from the past. And in any season of change, we each have to ask ourselves, what must I let go of to adapt to this new set of circumstances? And what can I keep? to preserve my identity into the future. To complicate matters, we know that change is not necessarily good or bad in and of itself. Often, it depends on how it's used. 
A new invention or idea may be morally neutral, but may bring with it a great potential for good or evil, depending on how that technology or idea is applied. Take, for example, the invention of dynamite. Originally, TNT was invented by Alfred Nobel with the intention that it would be used to benefit humankind. It would be for breaking rocks and construction work or for digging tunnels or mining minerals from deep within the earth. But later in his life, Nobel happened to read a story about his invention in the newspaper and he was distressed to find that the writer talked of dynamite's potential as an instrument of violence and of military superiority. So from the money he made as the result of his invention, Alfred Nobel established the Nobel Peace Prize awarded each year to one who is sacrificed to better the lives of others. He hoped to encourage the good in humanity and to protest against the use of his invention for war. Along those same lines, we find that the word crisis, a word that normally means turning point or a time of decision, a time of significant change, this word in the Chinese language is represented by a symbol that is made up of two different words, danger and opportunity. So both the positive and the negative are a part of that concept of crisis. Just like Nobel's dynamite, a crisis has the potential for good or bad. It can lead us into dangerous waters or it can elevate us to new opportunities for growth, depending on how we deal with it. Sometimes the changes in our life do come to us with the force of dynamite, an incredibly disruptive explosion that shakes the very foundations of our faith. Our current pandemic situation could, call it, could fall into this category depending on how deeply it has impacted our lives. For some, it may be just an inconvenience, but for others, it has caused life-shattering mayhem and death. There are other changes, though, that aren't so dramatic. They're subtle. They creep in from around the edges, and before we notice them, They've made their camp to stay, like those gray hairs which we finally give up pulling out. We who face changes daily need resources in our lives to help us know how to cope effectively with our crisis opportunities. The preacher of Ecclesiastes is known to be one of the biblical writers who has the most pessimistic outlook on life his opening lines declare that life is all vanity. And yet I find the poem which begins chapter three to be strangely comforting and beautiful. This well-known passage of scripture seems to impart a spirit of serenity and acceptance to the constant ebb and flow of life, like tides washing to and from the shore. To everything there is a season, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. The listener is reminded that life is ever changing, that the only predictable thing is that what we have now will someday seem tired and old and be replaced by something new. And yet, Ecclesiastes reminds us that we are not alone in our journey. There are timeless realities which undergird our human struggle to make sense of our existence. This timelessness comes from God, who put the sense of eternity into the human heart. Whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it or anything taken from it, says Ecclesiastes. From our finite vantage point, where we see our lives as though through a mirror dimly, we can only stand in awe of God's eternal and constant presence throughout the fabric of our lives. Jesus echoes this assurance in the Sermon on the Mount when he invites us to stop being anxious about the changes which happen in our daily lives. He says rather, 
trust that God is at work in creation and God stands beyond the realm of time to bring structure, comfort, and assurance to our existence. The great Christian writer C.S. Lewis has observed that we are as astonished with time as though it were again and again a novelty. He says, it is as strange as if a fish were repeatedly surprised at the wetness of water. And that would be strange indeed, unless of course the fish were destined to become one day a land animal. His point, of course, is that we are indeed destined for something other than this timed existence. We have within ourselves a longing for eternity. I think that what Lewis said of time is also true of change. Within the human soul, we are programmed for permanence. Although the developmental stages of life, birth, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, older age, and death, are entirely expected and predictable. We often balk at them and fear the loss which leads us from one stage into another. Says John Claypool, I got called out of the sand pile when I was six and told that I had to go to school, which was a death, but a whole world that I didn't even know existed was open to me. I had to let something go at some measure of pain to make myself accessible to going to elementary school. You know, every move of my life has involved dying so that I could be born to something else." Unquote. A time to be born, a time to die, says Ecclesiastes. Life is a series of deaths and rebirths transforming crisis moments where we let go of a little thing and get a bigger thing. If we can choose to accept the change which is coming into our life and respond to it adaptively, we will be able to experience growth and well-being and avoid staying forever anchored in a state of bitterness and regret. We need to focus on the eternal as Jesus put it, seek first the kingdom of God. Only then will the changing seasons of our lives not hold as much power to paralyze us with fear. If we know that even in death, God has conquered all things, we might be released from fearing our ultimate transition, the journey from this life into life eternal. We have God's promise that in the long run, the changes which threaten to wound us don't count. God's power is mightier and will guide us as we seek to respond to the changes in our lives wisely. Because we know that none of the material things of this world stand a chance against the press of eternity, because we know that our only secure dwelling place is in God, we are called by the words of Christ to treasure each day as it comes to us the changes and choices which this day brings are always rich with opportunity. Let us pray. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, you have been our companion in life's journey walking beside us each day of our pilgrimage on earth. As we mark the passing of time this week, we give you thanks for your presence and your steady, creative, energetic, and merciful love in our lives. We thank you for those days that challenged us and demanded that we think and re-examine our assumptions in new ways. We thank you for urging, prodding, and pushing us to grow and become the people we can be and you want us to be. We thank you also for those days when you have given us comfort and rest when we needed it most, when we had done all we thought we could do, when sorrow or grief had overtaken us, when we couldn't see to put one step in front of the other, you were there. We thank you for all the ways you have provided for our well-being. We thank you for family and for friends 
with whom we have shared the joys and sorrows of existence. We thank you for the dependable realities that never change amidst so much in our life that seems to change too quickly. As we go into a new week, still social distancing, still finding creative ways to connect with family and friends, we ask that you would help us to make each day count. Help us to find the promise and potential in each moment, even when our options feel limited. Continue to give us wisdom and guidance as we commend to your care our fears, our anxieties, our losses, our hopes, and our dreams. May we step forward in faith, relying on your love in Jesus Christ, from which nothing in this world, not even death itself, can separate us. Now let us join our voices to pray his prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us go now in peace to use our time well. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Creator, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with us always. Amen.